All right, and we're live. Welcome back to the Loopcast. Uh, our pre-show conversations included people who are follically challenged, the bald community, and uh, we have one of those members here. So Josh is here to represent. Thank you. Hey, for you being know here something? God made a few perfect heads. The rest are covered with hair. <laughs> <laughs> I like that play. I always did say if if I were to ever start going bald, my play would be shave it immediately and grow a beard. Thoughts on that, well, sir? I mean, I was starting to bald, and I'm like, my goodness, this is terrible. And the next day, I shaved it, and I grew, started growing a beard. So that's exactly okay. what I did. So we're on the same page. We, like, don't know. look up here, folks. Look right here. <laughs> Great minds. I don't have alike. that. I don't have that luxury. If I start balding, I can't really grow a beard and shave it. So. We'll True. just go with the wig. The beard part would be tough, although you could shave the head, uh, which would also be tough in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, I have a weird shaped head, too. It's not, <laughs> it's not good. I think Girl, it's not good. First of all, okay. I mean, it's like so close to begging for compliments, all right? So first of all, stop. And second of all, you have a weird looking head? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, with the comment on the YouTube video I had a few weeks ago, it's an actual cone head. Oh, I mean, no, so Josh, I don't, hear... the, don't read the comments. I, I love it. I live for it. Come on, bring it on. Let's go. <laughs> That's Here, crazy. I'm, That's crazy. I'm, throwing, I'm throwing Happy Friday, all caps, in the chat. Yeah, I, I didn't want to say it, but I've gone through some of the comments, and I've seen the egg emoji a few times, and I'm just like, <laughs> the internet is just ruthless, especially you hop over to TikTok. Uh, Josh, they just can't, they can't argue against I got a thick skin. It's all right. Right, so they got to go ad hominem, which sucks. But uh, happy Friday. Uh, we're here live, uh, 11 Eastern time, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We're here with Logan and Josh, Tom, as always. And we have a couple stories. I mean, the big one, OJ passing away. But there's something that I wanted to tease a little bit before we get out. So uh, we have something called the Rainbow Wolves release. So uh, Catholic Accountability Project, it's a project we have here at Catholic Vote. It's basically an internal team devoted to researching for exposés. Uh, one that we get quite a bit is how we have Catholic ministries that are pushing a lot of really dangerous ideologies. Specifically, gender ideology is a big one. Uh, Pope Francis pointed it out in Dignitas Infinita, and we're here to give some more details. So it, this investigation is on New Ways Ministry. It's an organi organization that aims to dismantle Catholic teachings on sex, the family, and marriage. Uh, following the Vatican's release of the controversial document Fiducia Supplicans, New Ways Ministry was one of the pro-LGBT groups within the church that joined the secular media in celebrating the document, claiming it was a step towards the church embracing same-sex marriage. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the name Father James Martin. He is the leader of this initiative. No, 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 no. He's with Outreach. This is a different one. Wait, this is a... No, he's New Ways as well, I thought. He's with Outreach. Mm -hmm. This is Sister... Uh, uh, Gosh, I, wanna, I don't want to make sure I, I, I get her name wrong. Um, but no, Sister Gramic, she's the one involved. Oh, in Je one. Jeannie Gramic. That's right. Right. And the they I'm sure they're yeah. best friends. <laughs> I'm sure they're best friends. <laughs> I'm sure they're aware of each other. Uh, because yes, she went yes. to, she was at the Vatican for uh, the Synod, right? That's right. So and she had an audience with the, uh, with the Holy Father. Mm -hmm. and right. So people were building that up and saying, see, they have, you know, they have the, the Pope's ear. And that was a lot of, a lot of people were really worried that maybe this would mean that Pope Francis would embrace the LGB agenda. The, the concern, you know, you talk about same-sex marriage, which has catastrophic effects on society, obviously. But with, uh, what the Pope said uh, most recently, he talked about how, look, everyone has inherent dignity. And the, and the fact of the matter is just, you know, the answer to the problems that we face, like whether it's gender dysphoria, is not to mutilate the body, you know, you know, and if and if there's couples who are suffering from infertility, the the our heart goes out to them. But the answer is not to use IVF or artificial means. And so the church says all of us have dignity. We we don't want to, you know, we have to respect the body that our Lord gave us, and we also have to you know, respect other people's bodies. That's why you just don't rent a womb. That's So that was really about what the Pope had said. Everyone was worried, though, that the Pope might kind of go rogue. And uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately for these guys, good for us that he stayed true. But the the this organization, New Ways Ministry, was very upset with the Pope's recent document. And you're like, wait a minute now. You know, if, if you guys are ministering to people with same-sex attraction or gender dysphoria, 
you would think you would like what this Pope had to say on this subject because he was talking about God's creation, how man, how he made us man, male and female, and how we all have dignity. But Nui's ministry was hoping that the Pope would embrace the entire LGBT agenda. And um, I really, a lot of Catholics have asked that they heard about this organization, Nui's ministry, and they've been begging us to put something together. And we had our researchers uh, do a deep dive on this. Um, it's a very readable subject, but it gives you exactly uh, what this organization is all about and why they're bad Super news. robust. And, and I think the interesting, most interesting part of the expose to me is when you start looking at the funding, because you always got to follow the money. And a lot of these places are not very friendly uh, to Catholicism. So I'm going to leave you guys to go read that one. Go check it out. We'll leave it in the description. Uh, I cannot recommend highly enough. Worth your time. Very well done from the Catholic Accountability Project team. But... Today we got to talk OJ. So OJ Simpson uh, passed away from a battle with cancer yesterday, and uh, I think the who's going to find the real killer now? <laughs> I think the, the best tweet I saw on it was like, "We'll see if uh, these gloves don't fit. You must acquit." Works on St. Peter. Uh, we'll see. I, I I don't think it was a very good argument, but I think the reason that we're talking about OJ and the reason why the internet exploded yesterday is because he his trial and subsequent reactions were a complete cultural uh, mega bomb. I mean, nothing oh felt gosh. like it was the same afterwards, and so it just, sucked out all of the air. I totally mean, from a culture. Now, of course, this was before both of you were alive, right? Oh my <laughs> word! It was. So, so I, so I, Suddenly I'm old. It. so Josh, I, I want to hear, of course, the uh, lived experience perspective, but <laughs> I watched uh, this excellent program. It was a limited series on, I want to say it was FX uh, called the people versus OJ Simpson. Highly yeah. recommend. Uh, Rob Kardashian was played by the dude by friends. I think Cuba Gooding Jr. was OJ, but really what stuck out to me was just how much evidence there was that he did it. Uh, and then Johnny Cochran, the attorney for him, uh, playing the race card, going after Furman uh, for the racial slurs and just turning it into an absolute uh, cultural hysteria moment. It was all televised. It was all everywhere. It was a circus. It felt like me as somewhat of a precursor to the Kyle Rittenhouse trial and to the George Floyd trial. Um, I mean, but Josh, I sure. want to get your perspective. Well, maybe the George Floyd one, the Kyle Rittenhouse one was a bigger thing online than it was in terms of a culture moment. George Floyd was more, it was definitely full culture. I mean, everyone had an opinion on that. Kyle Rittenhouse was not as big as, as that. But the O.J. Simpson case, I mean, it, it, you can't, you really can't um, overstate how much this absolutely dominated the media. I mean, that story from a from a media standpoint was just too good to be true. I mean, O.J. Simpson, yes, he was a great football player. Um, and he was super charismatic, right? And he was, you know, he was in movies. I mean, he was funny, like, you know, watching, like, uh, uh, the Naked Gun movies, you know, with Leslie Nielsen. Um, he was also in, every time you watch football, or, you know, for, like, 10 years, he was on the Hertz ads, you know, he's running in the airport and he's leaping over, you know, the chairs. I mean, it's just the coolest thing, you know. And of course, the, the trial, right? You're talking about this super handsome, attractive black man, beautiful uh, blonde wife murdered. It was like, whoa. It, I mean, it was wall to wall coverage, every single development. I mean, flooding the zone. I mean, this was the, you know, like, from, from a cable news perspective, the 24-7 news cycle, right, that started with, like, the war in Iraq uh, back in 1991. But it it really just, I mean, you can't, if this just was so massive that at the point where they were going to announce the verdict, everyone in the country was watching it. I mean, everyone. And that, it, it's hard to over I, mean, I remember exactly where I was. I was in my college storeroom. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. And everyone was like, oh, I can't believe they said he was not guilty, except for this one basketball player. He's, yeah, the juice is loose. He's running around <laughs> like an idiot, you know, whatever. That's crazy. But that, you, if you see the reactions, they'll show that in, like, probably the documentary that well, you show. Well, Josh, like, did you see the Oprah reaction, how people reacted on Oprah? Go ahead. I have the clip here. Can you run that, yeah. Jessica? Entitled action, find the defendant or 
Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being of Crazy. Part count one of the information. Okay, so you want to know what this is really about? This is one of the things where you start to ask, what is this really about? Because unfortunately, it was not about whether or not this man murdered this woman and the other man too, uh, Ron Parham, I think his name was. It didn't become that. For the jury, it didn't become that at all, unfortunately. It became whether or not we should let him go free because of what happened to Rodney King in the nineteen ninety in the whole riots in LA in 1991. Yeah. That's what it was. And in fact, one of the jurors said that just this last week, uh, basically, or um, it, re, re, maybe she didn't say it this week, but it came back into the news with the death of OJ, that yeah, that's pretty much why we let him go. It was retribution for what, what had been done to Rodney King. And so why did why did the, the defense attorney play into the racial animus and say, oh yeah, this this cop, he went to move to Idaho and he's kind of a white ringer, white, white uh, supremacist kind of guy. Fine. And yeah, why did he do that? It's like, because he knew it would work, unfortunately. Right. So, um, you know, the whole thing was an absolute circus and it wasn't really about whether or not he was guilty or innocent. It became something else. No, because if it was based on the DNA, so I have the prosecutors provided DNA evidence, including both victims' blood being found in Simpson's car, Brown's blood being found on Simpson's socks, and blood from both the victims and Simpson found at the scene. Uh, to your point, the defense basically said the crime scene had been compromised and then played the audio tape report recordings of Mark Furman. Uh, he had denied that he used a racial slur, but he said he used it. And I, I was looking up just like in terms of media impacts, how this changed, how things like this are covered. Basically, as I understand it, it it was such like must see television that ratings basically required people to cover it at all times. Like even if you look back uh, to the Bronco chase, that's super iconic, the slow speed one, uh, that was played at the same time as the NBA Finals. So there's a split screen <laughs> of the NBA Finals on TV and this chase going on. And basically, the, the, profit, that chase, the, yeah. the profit incentives to cover everything regarding the OJ trial overrode the traditional media's usually tight button, uh, button up coverage of things like that, where it has to come from a news anchor at the end of the night. Uh, yeah. And it actually probably, and ironically, the Kardashians involved with this too, because it just pushed everything into this. And oh my gosh, cell phones put this on steroids. But everyone just wants to see the TMZ footage of stuff that's happening. This was basically like a TMZ trial. Right. Now, everything about this was totally crazy. Um, I have a friend who lived in Los Angeles at the time, and she actually, um, you know, it's funny, like I said, well, obviously OG did it, right? And she's like, well, I'm like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> and she said she believed that there was a decent theory that it was actually OJ's son. And oh, he I heard it. this. Yeah, And, and, and I... I Look, I'm not investing. I'm not trying to exonerate OJ, but like, you think to yourself, what would it take for you to t try to take the rap and say it wasn't me; it was this other guy? Well, it would only be if it were your son. So I don't know, but you know, like that to me makes sense. Um, I could actually understand that, um, but uh, who knows? I mean, it just—it's bizarre. It was an absolute crime of passion. I mean, the person, which I, probably is OJ, obviously. But uh, stabbing these two people so many times, you know, it's one thing if it's like a gun and it's like a heat of passion and bang, bang. But like the repeating stabbing, it was and, speaking and it's like it's unbelievable. <laughs> speaking, speaking of stabbing, I have another video. <laughs> so there's a lot of videos on the Internet. Uh, Jessica, if you could play the the stabbing video, <laughs> I'm not going to show the actual stabbing, but go ahead and roll it, Jessica. I promise that you will not ask me another question about the case. I will never ask you again. We won't have to talk about it anymore. Just did you do it? <laughs> no, I didn't. Nope. Did not do it. After we finished filming, OJ said to me that uh, he had a surprise for me, and I genuinely was surprised. I think it was his idea of a joke. And this is it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. What in the world, dude? Yo. Oh my gosh. Oof. I mean, part of it things was you don't joke about for four hundred dollars, Alex. Yeah, things that, but I think he genuinely was psychopathic. Like, 
Mm-hmm. To have no shame wow. about that and then joke about it after, yeah, the shifty eyes, yeah. like, ooh, yeah. the whole that's thing just kills me. That's a warning sign. I know yeah. my mom was convinced that he was innocent growing up, but my dad said that's just because she liked O.J. Simpson. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know who this says more about. You were my big, mom. Yeah. The biggest <laughs> problem, though, of course, it's so sad that we lost Norm McDonald last year because, man. Oh, he, man, the Norm he, stuff. He had so, I mean, that was like a repeated jokes against OJ all the time on Saturday Night Live. If he were still alive, he would be on Saturday Night Live this weekend. You can oh, count for sure. bets on it. Uh, and he even had that joke in front of the ESPN, the ESPY Awards. <laughs> it just, I mean, you got to watch them. <laughs> it's just savage. I mean, you know. Norm was ruthless. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, but it. Because he obviously did it. Like, like it was like he could do I, it because it was so obvious that he killed these people. And I mean, the part of the problem was too, he never, I mean, he, I think he had to pay a little bit of money in a civil trial. He was convicted of it. Yes, and then he, yeah. the, the whole thing people forget, he was put in jail for aggravated robbery, I think, for like 30 years. He was arrested in yeah. Vegas in like 2007. Yeah, because usually what happens with these celebrities or former, you know, athletes or whatever. They go to conventions, they give talks, they make right. money, you know, some other way. They open up a restaurant. Who's going to stop by? Hey, right, let's go have breakfast with OJ. Like, dude, like, <laughs> no, I, I killed someone. I dude. Mean, it's not happening. Like, <laughs> it was funny. I saw something that he would come golf. to the OJ Steakhouse. He was, a, yeah, right. He was a big golfer and he would golf with Arnold Palmer. And then when this trial was going on, he stopped, like, Arnold stopped um, associating with him. And then. Uh, I wonder why. However, he's Michael Jordan still golfed with him after. So like Arnold was like, ah, I can't do this anymore. And then Michael Jordan was still golfing with him after. So take that for what you want. But man, just so yeah. many things. Michael's not exactly that. squeaky clean either. Yeah, seriously. He probably had some gambling debts he had to repay. But the, the effect of the trial, though, I agree with what you said from the onset, is that it did have, I, I would say, a negative effect on race relations where whites are like, I mean, oh yeah, didn't he just do it? Like what? And, uh, you know, and so there's a whole lot of yeah racial, okay. there's a whole lot of racial stuff, you know, because of this. It's not just because he killed his, we believe, killed his wife, but that the wife was white. You know, it brought a whole, whole lot of, Oh, my gosh. I didn't, didn't even think about all that. But if we'd like a nice palate cleanser, if we want to move on. So I found this speech from the Masters from another iconic golfer, uh, Gary Player. Uh, so if we could run that Gary Player clip, Jessica, that would be great forget to mention this, to come to this great country, the United States of America, if you hear, you are so blessed, and you should kiss the ground every day, and just appreciate what this country's done for the world, not only for yourself, but it's about time America started doing more for their own. Gary Player, legendary I South like African it. golfer. It kind of reminded me of what you always say, Josh, of like Americans kind of have to be the only people that are ashamed of themselves and their history and their legacy. And you get Gary Player, South African, comes over, was probably the best player of all time before Arnold and Tiger came around talking about how great America was and or is and their impact on the world. And I do love that little line thrown in there, too, of like, it's time to start doing more for their own. It's like we need a South African to come tell us that like. So, yeah, I mean, it's always the immigrants who are so grateful for this, what this country has to offer that can that really say to America, it's like, why aren't you more proud of this country? Like, you know, you need to, you know, countries don't just happen. It, this this kind of situation doesn't just pop, you know, from Zeus's forehead like Athena. Like, this has to be cultivated like a garden. And if you let it go to waste, it, you know, a few generations, you end up like Venezuela. So, you know, you got to yeah. make sure you're doing what's right to keep the thing moving along, that you're teaching the young people about like what it means to, you know, to keep a country going and rule of law, private property, you know, the free enterprise system, you know, it doesn't mean you have to worship this kind of stuff and that you need values, you know, you can't be uh, doing crazy stuff like, you know, smoke a dope, bed hopping all day. <laughs> are you uh, are you a golf guy, Josh? Um, I mean, you know, look, I, I'm not, super into to golf um but it, it's funny it's not surprising to me that you'd have a golf uh pro talking like this i mean the target demo for the golf audiences are you know bald white masters. guys like me who are basically you know running the country right yeah i don't know the masters is pretty iconic though i think the masters probably is the most popular golf event outside Does of like, regular viewers of golf we should always make sure that we 
that, you know, you find a spouse that will love you as much as, you know, Jim Nance loves the Masters. That's really the question. <laughs> Seriously. I do love the Masters, though. Nice green jacket. Also, kind of a cool story. Scotty Scheffler, we covered this. Uh, not in the loop cast, but his wife uh, could potentially go into labor. And he came him and Sam Burns, another golfer, were like, yeah, if they go into labor, like, we're leaving. Like, I'm resigning and we're, I'm going to go be by my wife. There's nothing like seeing my son born. And th then all these golf people came out to like, how could you do this? How could you even fathom, like, not being there for the for the Masters, the biggest event in golf? And uh, Sky Shuffler's already won one, but you always love to see. I mean, there's nothing like. I'd be like, I've had six. Well, I really <laughs> missed this. Uh, I'm just teasing, gal. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's the Masters. The Masters is pretty great. So I thought that'd be a nice palate cleanser. But uh, yeah, I <laughs> we lost Logan. Uh, sorry, this is the the fun of a, a live show. We'll see when Logan pops back on. But there was uh, something in the news, and I was actually really deep in this one. So it seems like BLM have, has kind of chosen their next martyr. And I'm going to lay down some of the facts on this. So uh, his name is Dexter Reed. He's a 26-year-old uh, Chicagoan, uh, a black man, who was driving his car and was pulled over uh, by the police uh, for not wearing a seatbelt. And the smartly, the Chicago released the body cam footage. Oh, not Gary Player. Uh, the body cam footage of the altercation, and it was notable because 96 shots were fired. Uh, what's even more notable about it was that the first shots came from the car. So the police came to the car, and you'll see it all in the body cam footage. I'm not going to show it here. And they told him Thank to you. roll down his window. He r wouldn't roll down his window, and the windows were also tinted, which is also illegal. The reason why it's illegal is you can't see inside of the car. So you didn't know if other people were in there. You didn't know if guns were in there. You didn't know anything. So there, uh, it escalated. He shot, uh, this guy Dexter shot one of the cops in the forearm and they returned fire. So I think obviously tragic that people had to lose their lives here. I think the moral of the story, never shoot at police. I don't know what good could possibly come from shooting at police. Uh, it's suicidal. It doesn't make any sense. Just if you're ever encountering the police, just comply. I mean, there's no reason it was at a, a very public block during the day. But well, certainly don't contest them and certainly don't shoot at them. And, and you would think that the headline for this would be, you know, uh, driver opens up and shoots police, you know, and dies as police, you know, fight back. That's not what the headline no. was, was it, Tom? No, the headline was uh, police fired 96 shots in 41 seconds, killing black man during traffic stop. And notably, it's written by a British author. I think she might be living in Chicago now, but her education is all in England. Uh, and the picture is notable as well. It's a picture of him from his high school graduation. Uh, and I just thought how, well, first off, it took eight paragraphs in this Washington Post article to get to them mentioning, just mentioning, that he shot at the police first. Which Unbelievable. should have like, probably showed up in the headline. Eight paragraphs after the photo, after the headline. Give me a break. Really unbelievable. And then also, could you think about, so I'm 26. If something happened to me and I showed up in the news and they used a high school graduation picture of me, I would just, I'd feel so weird. I, I just, and I see this all the time with, with tragedies like this, where they show the high school graduation picture of a grown man. I mean, he's a grown man. He's 26. Yeah, you know why they do it though? It's like look at the future he had in four before him. So you're thinking he's like some 18 year old, 19 year old, just graduated from high school, got the whole life ahead of him, and these cops open up fire and kill him. And it's like, well, wait a minute, he so shot I, first. I did a little digging into internet lore. So the first, so I think the first time this kind of became like standard to use the high school graduation picture was uh, a previous case with I think it was Michael Brown. Let me find that for sure. Yeah, it was in St. Louis. Yeah, Michael Brown, he was a black man killed in an altercation with police. I believe it was in 2010. It was in the early 2010s where he wrestled the cop for his gun and was shot. So when media outlets uh, got the story, they went to his Facebook, public Facebook profile to go use pictures to accompany the story. And of course, they went to the Facebook profile. What did they find? They found him fanning cash, throwing gang signs. Um, and yeah, they just, you they can't just find used... a decent picture until you get all the way down to the diploma and you smile. <laughs> exactly. So they just right. used pictures they saw on Facebook. And so this really enraged uh, the, quote, black community and then also uh, some mainstream media outlets were upset about it as well. And so a whole trend started on Twitter. This is like early Twitter 
where uh, black professionals used uh, took pictures of themselves acting like gangsters to try to prove a point. Like, hey, I can just take pics like I'm a gangster. I'm not actually a gangster. I'm a pilot, uh, which is kind of mm. a weird two online weird trend flex. going on. Weird odd flex to want to act like that. But um, yeah, and also notable, they used his high school graduation picture, but they didn't use his mugshot uh, from five months before because he was ah. charged. Uh, he was charged with a felony of aggra- aggravated unlawful use of a wet, uh, weapon five months before. So um, what's crazy, too, about this story is uh, as soon as this happens now, of course, you're seeing like I think his brother got arrested at a, at a protest. Um, Jesse Jackson's getting involved, all the usual suspects. Um, but what's what's unusual to me about this is they were like the police shouldn't have pulled him over for not wearing a seatbelt. That was the the reasoning used. And I honestly don't know how the police saw he wasn't wearing a seatbelt because his windows were tinted, which is also illegal. Um, But I just, the reason he was pulled over is kind of, he's also a felon, so I'm sure they had it on his plates. Uh, I'm of the opinion if a cop should not have to wait to get shot at. Like if if you're in that situation where you can't see what's in the car and you see, and you, someone gets hit, one of your guys get hit, the number of shots is somewhat irrelevant, right? I mean, this just seems like a tragic event where someone didn't comply with the police who's well, probably doing something illegal. He was a felon. He had a gun in there, which is illegal. He shouldn't have had a gun. Um, to turn they're, this trying to into, make, they're trying to make the point that a whole bunch of cops shot a ton of bullets indiscriminately. That was the point they're saying by mentioning the number of shots. Understood, but it's a bad argument because right. I'm, I'm putting whatever I got in there if one of my guys gets hit. So I think the problem is we all live through 2020. It bothers me that this was uh, Washington Post and Reuters. It bothers me that mainstream outlets, no, understanding what happened in 2020 and the damage and scarring that did to the nation, would be willing to write headlines like this and mislead the public like this to whip up racial animus after what we've already lived through. Right. Um, and the thing is, the, the headline itself is not a lie. The photograph, well, that really obviously is him, but all of it is done in such a way to suggest something else. Yeah, you're intentionally allowing the reader to completely get the wrong idea because your first look at this thing you would suggest oh this was an innocent young kid who's like 18 19 20 years old and the cops just mowed him down indiscriminately that sounds horrible and you're like oh well you know by the way he shot first and the and, and a cop got shot and that's why they returned fire and you're like what what then people get upset because like this headline is is lying i mean it's totally deceptive. Yeah. And I actually I actually did watch the press conference from Mayor Brandon Johnson, who uh, we've given a hard time on this podcast and definitely isn't perfect. But one thing that I do appreciate and I think more of is the more of this, the better is just the quick release of the body cam footage, because I think the lack of transparency and the question mark can allow people to inflame tensions to a level that maybe they wouldn't. The reason we're able to have this conversation today is because we saw the body cam footage. And for those who want to see it, can see it, and then it feels like there's more transparency between the police and the public. And I think that really is what's going to keep this from turning into, you know, the next George Floyd or the next Trayvon Martin or or whatever. And in the past, I think they've really made mistakes of not releasing it immediately. So I do want to credit Chicago for that and um, tragic all around. uh, But I want to point out to well-meaning people reading this, like like Josh said, these are intentionally, it might not be a lie, but they're written intentionally for an end purpose. And I just think it's reckless and irresponsible. Yeah, they want people to get the wrong message. 100%. So uh, we get to move on from that now. Next we have on the docket, so standardized testing returns. Josh, do you want to reveal your ACT or SAT score on the podcast? Got a twenty six on my ACT, <laughs> dude. I knew you would know it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well done. My wife um, did, uh, also got a twenty six. She. You know. Did you take the SAT? I did not. Okay. Yeah, I only took the ACT as well, and I think I don't don't. I'm not gone to my head here, but I think I had I got a twenty eight or twenty nine. Okay. This isn't this isn't a dunk, Josh. But the only reason I did. Uh, I took it again. I think I might have started with like a 26 or something, but my brother got a 28 
and I could not have done where some of my older brothers. So once I got a 20, I was like, all right. Well, standardized tests in the 21st century are a different story. I mean, I took it back when it was the real deal. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, you know, if I would have taken it during COVID, I wouldn't have even needed to take it. I just would have applied because major universities such as Harvard, they Caltech, scrapped it all. Yeah. Yale, Brown, they scrapped, scrapped it all, which was kind of insane. And I think for the reasons of equity, they were saying like, Impoverished people didn't have the same opportunities, access to tutors, yada, yada, yada. Uh, well, they've all decided to reverse course. So all of those universities are now going to require it uh, for people seeking admission for fall 2025. And I don't know if I it mean, was a weird test, but it seems like it did not achieve the results they were hoping for. It is, it's hard to imagine a, something that, you know, liberal academia goes through all sorts of fads and fashions, you know. And they embrace something like so. They all embrace, you know, BLM after George Floyd. Obviously, they embrace all the trans stuff and everything in the Rainbow Coalition. But this thing, you know, the scrapping of standardized tests and having to take these tests in order to get accepted, all these Ivy League schools, all these schools got rid of it in a big wave. And now they're all backtracking, and it's pretty quick. I mean, this has only been like three years or so. And so that. That, that reversal that is so quick is uh, really a sight to see. I mean, it must, it must have really backfired. And the students that are coming in and the faculty, there must have just been, you know, this is not the Harvard we thought it was going to be. This is not the Yale. This is not, well, you know, we need to up the ante here and make sure that we're getting students that can handle the material. So, I mean, I, I have, it, you rarely see a social experimentation be turned around this rapidly. Um, yeah. I, I'm happy to hear it. Yeah, I think to me, the, the thing about the AC, S, ACT and SAT is you can make all the arguments that people that uh, have more money have more access to tutors or, or training to improve on the test. But the one thing that everyone has access to is the test itself. So the great equalizer is that everyone is going to have to take this test. You could have the greatest tutors in the world. You could have no tutors. Everyone has to take the test. So you still have the same opportunity to be evaluated on a marker that is a good suggester as to whether or not you're going to be able to handle course load or whether or not you'll succeed in college. So, yeah, I think this is like the ultimate. I, I remember during that period of time, too, I saw a lot of like viral videos of kids just getting rejected from colleges who had like stellar scores that didn't mean anything because they weren't taking them. And uh, I just think the less we make it about you know, what your race well, or your ethnicity there's this or whatever. Stuff. And you're right that, that they're playing games and, and, and trying to do with equity. And, you know, it's like um, it's affirmative action on steroids where like if you're Asian or white, you, you have like almost no shot at some of these schools. In fact, California passed it through the ballot box getting rid of affirmative action. So what do the state schools like Berkeley do to get around that? If you want to apply to a school in at one of the UC schools, they require you to record a tape to submit, you know, where you're making your pitch, oh, why yeah. you should go there. And so then they can filter out Asians and whites and, you know, in increase their diversity quota at, at, to high heaven. Right. It's pretty crazy. You know, pretty, pretty soon, crazy. if I were, if I were, if I were an entrepreneurial Asian, I would just open up a, a, a school where it's just for Asian students and it would instantly be the number one school in the country. And I mean, that's what Jewish uh, people did in the 20th century. They thought they faced so much discrimination and it was hard to get into some of these schools because you were Jewish. So they started their own universities and uh, it proved to be very successful. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised you see, see that kind of return. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so this is probably my video find of the week. So uh, there's a representative from New Hampshire. She's actually a survivor of communism. Jessica, if you could just roll that clip, I think it really speaks for itself. This was at a gun control debate with David Hogg. The communism and under Mao, you know, 40 million people were starving to death after he sold the communism to them and 20 million people died, murdered during his cultural revolution. So my question to you, David, is that can you guarantee me a gun owner tonight? Our government in the U.S., in D.C., will never, never become a tyrannical government. Can you guarantee that to me? 
There's no way I can ever guarantee that any government will not be tyrannical. Well, then the debate on gun control is over because I will <laughs> never give up my guns. Never, never. And you should go to China to say how Love gun it. control works for dictatorship of CCP. That's the kind of woman you want as your neighbor. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, totally. It reminds me of when we were talking about the, the third body problem, or three body problem, I believe. The show when they showed the struggle session in front of people, first thing they do is they come for the guns, man. That's all I gotta say. I know uh, President Biden just released a new executive order trying to target. Uh, it's a new gun control measure. Um, as I understand it, and I think more is to come on this, and it's going to be, have to be. I'm sure there's going to be court fights over it. Basically, they're trying to get around what they're considering the gun show loophole. Uh, oh, that's, such, that's so baloney. <laughs> which is that's just a, a total fallacy. I mean, I've been to gun shows. Right, yeah. exactly. As someone who's this been to gun shows. This idea that they're just swapping it like it's a, you know, a garage sale. It's a bunch of baloney. Right. It's, it's like an absolute lie. From as I understand this, and they cover this pretty well in the Morning Wire, they're just basically making it harder for everyday citizens to sell guns to uh, or to buy guns. Because, of course, this doesn't apply to any of the felons who can't get guns right now or the illegal guns are like, oh, we're going to get rid of all these illegal guns. It's like, that's just, that's not how it works. But I, I always, when you have the domestic arguments over gun control, like it is hard because I feel like people are entrenched, but it, it's important to understand though, from people who have experienced real communism, I think even like we had someone comment, like, why does Catholic vote care about gun control? Like, why, why would we even like Because we hate that tyranny? I don't know. Right? Like, exactly. Yeah. And I, and I'm like, pretty... first of all, like, I, look, you know, you live in the suburbs or whatever, you know, um, I live in the rural area. Like if some guy comes to my door, meaning harm, like what I'm, I'll call 911 and maybe the cops will show up 20 minutes from now. Like, no, no yeah, dude, like no, are you no, kidding no, me? No. I'm protecting my family. I'm not well, going to wait for someone to show up. Most, uh, most encounters involving guns all have take place in the matter of like three minutes, I think is the average. So unless you're police, right. like there's no, I'm not leaving my family after that. But so this guy was like, I had no idea that guns were so important to the Catholic voter. I don't recall ever hearing the Pope discuss the importance of having guns. And I was like, well, I can tell you, uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, Evangelium Vitae, legitimate defense can not only, can be not only a right, but a grave duty for someone responsible for, responsible for another's safety, the common good of the family or of the state. And this is Pope John Paul II, AKA the Pope that properly understood communism. Logan, welcome back. Hello, it's good to be back. This does not work. <laughs> <laughs> this archaic, I don't know if the viewers can see this, it's an ethernet, it doesn't work. Live show Josh fun. told me to buy it. Do you have, uh, <laughs> do you have any thoughts on uh, the gun control debate? Yeah, um, I was at a gun show last weekend, and they do do background checks because it took forever to get the gun that I won. So, yeah. Oh, you you won I a think gun? That's, I did. That's fun. A, tw a 22. So, yeah. Very nice. Can't wait to go shoot that. I, but, no, I, I think that it's crazy because at the end of the day, you know, they say they, they're trying to prohibit these illegal guns from being on the streets, but the bad guys are going to get guns anyways. So you're just preventing the good guys from having guns. It's a pretty simple debate. If you look at crime that's happened with the everything that makes them scream for gun control, those guns are so rarely obtained legally. It's insane. Right. It was yeah, crazy too. Also, you, you see what happened in London. They got rid of all the guns and now oh they're, trying, they're calling for knife control. Knife control, gun bombing, or like the bombing, the car bombings have been kind of crazy. But um, so here's a good example. Even in Indiana, whenever I have conversations with people about it, like, yeah, we have constitutional carry now. So apparently open carrying has always been legal, which is kind of crazy. Like as long as it's on the outside, you're fine. But for concealed carry, you can now do it constitutionally. And some people like, well, yeah, many people talk I about love it. constitutional carry, though, Tom. Like it's like, what's your permit? It's like right here. It's called the Bill of Rights. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> That's my permit. <laughs> but but I think some people it makes some people squeamish that like, oh, so you're saying anyone can just like carry conceal? I was like, yeah, but you know criminals do it. Any like they're not gonna tell you. And like so basically this just opens the door for well meaning people that want to carry guns and are not criminals to do it. It has nothing to do well, with criminals. 
And anybody would tell you, if you live in a state that has constitutional carry, I live in a state that has constitutional carry. We used to have open carry, um, just like just like you, Tom. Anyone will tell you, any responsible gun owner will tell you, get your CCW anyway, because if you ever plan to travel, you should have yep. your CCW. So that being said, constitutional carry does not mean it's a free for all. Just get guns and go out there and mess around. You should still be responsible and for take sure. the courses that you need to take. But I think it's great. Yeah, I got my uh, I have a permit. So I have a handgun permit. Reason being it reciprocates between a lot of different states. So like Indiana and I want to say like 20 some states don't quote me a decent amount. Uh, of course, not Illinois, which we just saw that that shootout. But um, you have to get a FOIA card, and they have crazy gun control. But Indiana, just, Ohio, Michigan—they all reciprocate. See, I think the thing is, people just have this view of modern society, like, oh, everything's fine. You know, we have manicured lawns and air conditioning homes, and we drive to work and we wave to our neighbors, and oh, traffic, beep beep, no big deal. It's like, do you not understand that? You know. Even our own country could break down and things could go crazy. We saw that. We saw that oh in gosh, Minneapolis man. with George Floyd. For sure. We saw that in cities around the country. Like, And we have these eco-terrorists that will take over freeways. So you can't even get to anywhere. It's like the idea that you, you should be completely defenseless is a bunch of garbage. Like no one should have to be like at the complete whims of a mob. No way. No Never. thanks. Did you see what happened in Oakland, California over the weekend? There was that jewelry store. It was like a couple that owned this jewelry store. And these guys, there was about five guys that broke in. They were smashing the glass containers. They were stealing the jewelry. And the husband came out with his gun and chased them all out. And it's like, there it is. Yeah. There's America. What, one of my, I think my favorite quote, uh, God made man and then Samuel Colt made man equal. <laughs> that's right. Well, I mean, that's actually the thing. You talk about like crime, like it's the great equalizer. You know, like if a, a, a woman is going through major cities like New York City or LA and she needs to protect herself, like someone who is six feet, 300 pounds, what are you going to do to stop them? Well, a gun might just convince them, I'm not going to mess with this lady. Yeah. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, protect yourself that way. Well, it's crazy. I mean, well, I was going to say, Logan, like from the female perspective, I've been in situations mm -hmm. where I've been a little nervous. I'm like, could I imagine, you know, being in an elevator in a in a somewhat empty building by myself with someone else in there with no gun? Parking like, lots. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I've, no, I personally, most women have had an experience. I, I think I speak for all women. We've all been in at least one experience where it's like, if you didn't have a gun, you wished you did. I've been in parking lots or parking garages in DC where you're not supposed to have a gun without that. They have a permit that you can get, but it's super difficult to get. Um, and I actually had a situation where some men pulled up in a, a van next to me. I didn't have cell service because it was one of those underground parking garages. Jeez. They opened the doors to the van. They sort of yelling and I took off running in the opposite direction and they they drove off but in that moment if I had had a gun I wouldn't have had to just run I would have felt a lot safer and so I think most women have had an experience like that yeah absolutely geez all right well shout out to New Hampshire uh, we move now into the Twilight Zone I believe who we have up you get to go first because you know how we, we I get to go first that. this week. Yeah, I haven't gone first in a while. All right. Well, uh, mine goes to childhood. So uh, the consumer reports came down on Lunchables and it was not very good. Uh, <laughs> the the, uh, the verdict is that you probably shouldn't be eating them. I think they contain dangerous levels of chemicals. Shocker. Uh, I think I may have had one of these in my lifetime. Uh, my parents fortunately gave me pretty healthy food. Um, I think the what <laughs> my mom never bought it, and we always wanted it. It's like, Please. Exactly, yeah. It's like the uh -oh. shiny packaging and the commercials and stuff. Um, if you go uh, scroll down on this article, you can see uh, they have the levels of lead and sodium. So in, uh, in the turkey and cheddar, they have seventy four percent lead, forty nine percent sodium. Uh, this is uh, so Consumer Reports tested 12 store bought lunch and snack kits for lead and obtained sodium levels from the nutrition labels on each package. Lead is measured in percentage of California's maximum allowable dose level, MADL. Our experts use this value because there are no federal limits for heavy metals in most foods, and California lead standards are the most protective available. 
Sodium is measured in percentage of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines recommendation. So that 74% of lead is 74% of what is considered an acceptable dose level by California. That's a lot of lead. Like I, I know we were talking about, we've talked about Flint before um, and how problematic that was, but yeah, basically uh, I hate to do this to people that are big Lunchable peoples, but I would probably stay away from this if possible. Uh, I, I never thought they tasted very good personally. Um, the, the direction we've gone with my child and I think our future children, they just really just eat what we eat. So like my wife and I eat pretty healthy for the most part. And then for lunches, we just do leftovers. So we'll just keep it in like glass containers. And he legitimately eats everything we eat. I don't know where we got in this weird like sigh up that parents just, and I think it's probably out of convenience and marketing, but parents just give Absolutely. their kids um, these packaged colorful things out of ease uh, because it's already packaged and it it's looks ease. fun. Kids and like it. It's marketed right. to kids. Other kids at the, at, at, at the cafeteria have it. Why can't I have this mom, dad? Yeah. Right. And I don't know is like, is it a, is it really that surprising to people? Probably not. But I think a lot of people do still consume this. I hope not. I, I, I'd like to think the internet kind of helped in exposing a lot of this, but yeah, I just saw the grocery like, stores, bro. You dude, this stuff. everywhere in the grocery store, and this yeah, is actually so are people still eating it? Yes, of course they are. You it's know? a little like, bit of a personal passion. Are people still of mine. Big Macs. Yeah, they are, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I took it. So I took a nutrition class in college. It was actually uh, phenomenal, and it really opened my eyes to a lot of this stuff. And actually, how and we maybe can get into this another time. The government basically self-created the obesity problem. Uh, one, by releasing the, the food pyramid approved by the FDA, which is like ridiculous. No nutrition advice would be followed from that food pyramid <laughs> released in like the 70s or 80s, can't remember. And then they also subsidized uh, the corn industry in America. So we had all this excess corn because there's financially incentivized for farmers to grow it. Right. And then from that corn uh, was invented high fructose corn syrup. So instead and, of actual syrup, it's used. And what? And the politicians from Texas and Louisiana convinced Congress to pass a tariff on sugar imports, making sugar artificially expensive in the United States. Therefore, the corn syrup becomes an alternative. And you're right, we're subsidizing corn syrup and we're taxing sugar. Not that sugar's good, sugar's not good, but sugar is better than corn syrup. And Much better. Be oh my gosh. It's totally so the wrong thing on that. Exactly. And it's funny, people are getting back to things like beef tallow now, which I, was used in the past, or like lard, things like that, instead of a lot of these mm -hmm. oils that are being recommended now, like vegetable oil basically could be used as tractor fuel. Like it's crazy. Yeah, didn't they find so out that didn't they find out that somebody was like paid off to the American Heart Association to say the vegetable oil was better than butter? Oh, totally. Like it was the same thing with yeah. uh, Coca Cola. So Coca Cola funded mm -hmm. a study, completely funded a study a as study. to whether or not yeah, right. As to whether or not pop was uh bad for you. And I, do you guys have any guesses on how that one came out? Mm, they said it was okay. Yeah, they said it was okay, inconclusive. So pop was as long as you too. have sugar free. Their new sugar free one's great for you. Oh, Aspartame. No. Is... I don't trust any of that stuff. <laughs> oh, gives me headaches every time I drink it. That's always Sweet my first. Sweet aspartame. <laughs> Sorry if we have any any pop drinkers on the, on the program, but my first advice to people anytime they're like, I want to start eating better, I want to start losing weight, cut Never pop out. The pop is the first thing you should be cutting out. It's like. You can sugar, ha add so much more sugar into one thing because it's liquefied as opposed to like a physical food. Also, you can drink way more than you can eat. So, yeah, cut out the pop. You'll thank me for it later. Sorry to any of the pop drinkers. I, mean, but. I do love a good Coke Sierra. But. <laughs> Logan. No. I'm one, just one, kidding. Just kidding. One, one once in a while <laughs> is not bad. The, the other interesting thing, too, and I think Brian was The only time this. I have Coke is then it's a rum and Coke. Ah, there you go. That's funny. Yeah, people kind of give an excuse as alcoholic. But Brian was talking about how with his kids, he just gave them uh, like LaCroix. And so they they never experienced pop. So the first thing they had was a fizzy drink. And fizzy drinks are kind of fun. So it's seen as like right. a treat or like something fun. And they love it. And so they've never done pop at all. I'm like, I think that's the play. Like I didn't know. Yeah, about he told it. me about that. And that's that's what I started doing. We now our fridge has got a ton of this, uh, you know, fizzy, what is it, LaCroix, all that other well, stuff. Yeah, yeah our kids have love you it. guys seen? Have you guys seen like the poppies? They're actually very good I have for seen you. Those. And yeah, so my brother, that's what he does. It's like a treat. It's rare, but if they get a soda, it's a poppy, and it's like the apple cider drinks. Yeah, isn't it like um, 
It's like fermented. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, taste yeah. pretty good. I their Coca Cola flavored one is. I mean, if you haven't had a Coca Cola ever, you think it's great. If you haven't had a Coca Cola in a long time, you think it's similar. <laughs> I wouldn't compare them side by side, but yeah. All right, I'm 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 hopping off my nutrition uh, conspiracy high horse here, but yeah, I got pretty deep into that. So uh, I believe Mercer, we have you next. Well, you know, I, Democrats like to talk about stability all the time in politics and, and you know, the decorum of, of the, you know, because the January 6th, how could it, you know, to attack on democracy? And they have no problem making a spectacle of the our legislative bodies. So in Arizona, you know, did you see this? A bunch of Democrats. Because oh, we had the court ruling where the Supreme Court in Arizona. literally children these are not protesters these are members democratic members of the arizona state house total tantrum session it's like children good for that guy for just walking well and the one guy the one person One person screamed. These Democrats were so upset with the Supreme Court ruling that allowed, you know, babies to be protected in law and not to be, you know, sliced and diced by the abortion industry. And these, uh, pro- these I can't call them protesters. They're actually members of the state house. They were yelling that there was blood on their hands. Like, wait, what? That's the twilight. You're calling for were... murder, and you're saying other people have blood on their hands. Like, hmm. Uh, I think you need to go back to school. Yeah, that was the twilight zone that that wasn't like protesters sitting in causing disruption. Like these are people that were elected, full grown adults elected to represent the people were like resorting to slow. There's like a media chart on this. Like, okay, are they Democrats that call for abortion rights? Oh, then it's heroic. Yes, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. If they're in there and they're Republican, resurrection, no decorum. Or not resurrection. Yeah. Insurrection. Uh, insurrection, yeah. You, you got used to it in your mind, and that's okay. But yeah, insurrection <laughs> is what they accuse us of. Logan, what do you what do you think that's about crazy. the, the uh, decorum so, in politics? So it's funny because I, there are several videos out there like that. I mean, in Ohio, we had that when they pitched, passed the issue one to be on the ballot. The Democrats, like, whipped out signs and started running in a circle, like, around the speaker's <laughs> desk. It was, like, the creepiest thing. They, like, cut the live feed. I was like, no, I was watching this. <laughs> it just got good. <laughs> it got interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Maru <laughs> show. Yeah, I mean, we've seen in the past couple years, we've seen fist fights on House floors started by Democrats like it's insane and I think at the end of the day it's like at some point people have to start realizing that there's this just absurd double standard that we're facing in every aspect of the difference between the two parties and by no means am I saying the Republican Party is the the picture of decorum but <laughs> <laughs> I am no nope. I'm gonna yeah most definitely I'm not. gonna have to say you know like most two-party systems you got to go with the lesser two of two evils and here we are yeah so I always laugh at the um, Marjorie Green Taylor uh, showing up to the State of the Union and all like the Trump stuff, and then Biden kind of looking at her like, "Whoa!" And I was like, "Dang, R- rare W for Biden in that situation." Um, yeah. yeah. All right, Logan, got your twelve zone. My turn. Um, mine's pretty quick, but in Alabama, we saw that uh, a young gentleman, or so we thought age 26, uh, created a makeshift bomb that he detonated outside of the AG's office in Alabama. Whoa. Um, And if you read the articles on this, none of them mention the fact that he's transgender. He is a she. Um, He's a they, them. Uh, And so nobody's talking about that part of it. He slapped stickers on the doors that say, support your local Antifa before he detonated the bombs. And so he potentially is facing up to 20 years for this, but I think it's interesting that nobody is talking about the fact that he's trans and, you know, trans violence is violence too, but nobody <laughs> wants to talk about that. Yeah. Wait, Josh, you, you got to consult the chart for that one. Is there the proper way to handle when people bomb stuff? It depends on their identity. Someone or, call HR. <laughs> yeah. Um, what? Because uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. this is like the 26 year old episode here. 
Yeah. No, apparently when you turn 26, you do crazy things. So watch out, Tom. Yeah, I guess, man. She's had us. No, but I do think it's I do think it's it's good. Nobody was hurt. Um, at the end of the day, he used technology that's used in fireworks to create the bomb and filled a coffee canister with nails and other things oh in gosh. hopes that it would. Yeah. And so uh, detonated it inside or outside the office. And they're assuming that it's connected to Antifa due to the stickers. Um, but obviously a deeply troubled kid. He's from Irondale, which is. Oh, we lost Josh. Yeah, He's from Irondale. Um, and which is interesting because that's the area that EWTN is. And so. Oh. Uh, Wait, yeah. what was, so do you did they get to the supposed motivations of specifically the attorney general's office? They're assuming that. It just has to do with the fact that the AG is uh, a conservative AG and they're still, I mean, it's super early. This just happened. Um, and so they're assuming it just has to do with him feeling like he's too conservative and he's not supporting the, the progressive agenda that he wants him to support. Gotcha. So hence the Antifa stickers. So that, that gives him Our, a license to bomb. Yeah. A real mm. hero. Maybe he thought that was his. <laughs> Maybe he thought that was like his past because, you know, he's trans and he's worth Antifa. Therefore, right. he can't go to jail. Right, right. So yeah. we might have our next uh, Krispy Kreme uh, debate moment here. Shout out to uh, John uh, just coming out hot with It's Soda, Not Pop, where I live on the East Coast, namely liberal New Jersey. And it says he shared Never Misses Loop, best podcast social media. Shout out, John. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm going to have to disagree. It's definitely pop. Uh, it's you, actually you, Coke. Yeah, I was going to say, so there's like three camps, yeah. right? There's the pop, soda, and camp, uh, and Coke camps. Yeah, so I'm yeah, in the Coke camp. but why are you camp. Coke? Because you're from I'm Florida. I'm from Alabama. You are from Alabama? Alabama? I'm from Alabama. So originally, I was born in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, um, which is near Huntsville, so like near the Tennessee line. And then I grew up, my dad moved um, our family to the Panhandle, but we were 20 minutes over the Alabama line. So the Panhandle of Florida is like, Lower Alabama. Yeah, basically so. it's Alabama. But so yeah. what are the breakdowns of like who calls it Coke? Isn't it the South? Yep. The South says Coke. Okay. And then if you're at a restaurant and you say you want Coke, they'll say, okay, what kind? And uh, so okay. then you would specify. Mm -hmm. But so the South and then is soda. Uh, did soda make it out to the West Coast too? I know East Coast, I think is soda. Midwest is pop. I can confidently say. Yeah, so Ohio is split. I know Ohio because even though it's Midwest, it's also slightly like you have a lot of East Coast people in Ohio. So yeah. half the people say pop, half the people say soda. Okay, well, I grew up in good old Metro Detroit, Michigan. It was pop there. It's going to be pop to me. But shout out if you say soda or Coke. Soda or Coke, I don't judge. Um, it's I would a real just shame say that Josh isn't here for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, sh I'm sure the you. The most important debate thoughts. we've had. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Josh is leaving me out to dry here. But yeah, I think that about does it for this Friday episode. Thank you uh, so much. Oh, Josh, you're coming. <laughs> I mean, I'm, right. in, about to close. I'm in the waiting room. You won't let me in. I mean, come on, dude. I'm How do you think I? Yeah. Thought? Well, okay. Then <laughs> I'll give you your your couple minutes of fame here. Um, it's so one of those fun internet debates, and it's like, who cares? <laughs> okay, Josh. Call it soda. And, call it pop. Just as long as you don't call everything Coke. And oh, okay. I call everything Coke. Hey. And we'll end on that. So, and that's uh, why you're wrong. Is this, is this because I called you bald? <laughs> is this because I called you bald? I'm not offended. I'm bald. Huh? I mean, that's what I am. That's a fact. <laughs> and right. Allison says you're just taller than your hair. Yeah. Shout out to all of our follically challenged members of the listeners. Um, that does it for this episode. If you want to help us out, leave a like, subscribe to the YouTube. Uh, you can leave us a review, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. If you want to email me, loopcast at catholicgo.org. So work through some of those. Uh, but we're praying for you. We hope you guys have a great weekend. Thank you for joining the live show. If you guys are here, shout out to you guys. And um, we will see you on the next one. St. Uh, Thomas More, St. Fidelis, Our Lady Guadalupe. Pray for us. And we'll see you guys on the flip. Peace.